Yep. I see two people on. Hi. Just giving a few minutes to um, allow people to, to hop on. And again, it'll be um, on our timeline after we um, finish up. Just letting um, people hop on. Okay, so we're at about 150 people um, now. So I'll go ahead and get started just in the interest of time. And this will be on the timeline after we're done. Um, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for hopping on again. And I wanted to kind of um, start out by explaining some of the data that is, is out there right now um, for our county and that we're posting now um, daily. And we're gonna update that every day at approximately 4 p.m. with new cases. Um, I can tell you now, as of right now, we have not had any additional cases since yesterday. So we're still at 11. So I'm gonna hold this up and see if I can show you a little bit. Um, but this is the data that you're seeing that we're posting on Facebook and that you know we're, we have on our website um, that like I said, we're gonna update every day at four. And I just kind of wanted to explain. So right here is uh, the total amount of cases. So we're at 11. This here breaks down um, the information by, by age group, okay? So these are the same amount of cases, just breaking this number down by what age group they're in. Down here is, is what uh, contact or how we think that they came to have had COVID-19. So I, I wanna kind of break that down a little bit because as you can see, um, we have four right now that we know that were contacts to confirmed cases, okay? We have four that are still under investigation, which means we just can't, oh, image is mirrored. I'm so sorry, I'm not, I'm not good at this, but when you look at it, at least you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but so the, the part where it says um, travel, contact, you know, how that case came to be, um, four of those are still under investigation. So we're not 100% sure yet. Um, and through our investigation, as we learn more information from these cases, um, we find out, um, you know, possibly where uh, this case came to, um, came to be and how it was acquired, um, how it was transmitted, that type of thing. So um, as it stands, we still have four that are under investigation that we're, we're still looking into to decide, you know, what we, what we think uh, or where we think that, that infection came from. But right now we have um, three that we do not know um, where that came from. And that means that person has not traveled, that person does not know somebody or is not connected to someone that has COVID-19 or someone that has been sick with similar symptoms. And so what that tells us is that um, you know COVID-19, uh, is it's possible that it is in the community. So when you hear the words community spread, um, that really means that it's, it's out in the community and we really uh, don't have a source. We don't have a way to say, yes, this person traveled to a place that's being affected heavily by this. And we know cases are increasing in Missouri, so we expected this, but that's important to know um, because uh, we're not able to say now, you know, just if you haven't traveled, then you can't have COVID-19. Um, we all need to be diligent in watching for those signs and symptoms, um, fever, dry cough, certainly shortness of breath, that type of thing. Um, the World Health Organization has a full list of, of symptoms. We also have that on our website under the frequently asked questions or follow up questions from Facebook Live. And so it has a whole paragraph. Now fever, cough, shortness of breath, those are the top and most common ones, but we've also seen some uh, gastrointestinal symptoms with um, uh, diarrhea, that type of thing. So that's important um, to know that as well. Um, some other things just kind of on here again, I know it's mirrored, but you know, we break it down by biological sex and I know there's a part that says unknown. Sometimes when we get these reports, there's information missing off of them and we have to dig a little deeper to figure out, um, you know, is this a man or a woman or that type of thing. So that's why there's an unknown category. Um, right now we know that there are two males and nine females, um, that have been diagnosed with COVID-19 in St. Francis County. 
And then um, as, as you see here, this tells you recovered or um, has who has uh, been hospitalized at any point in their illness. So that doesn't mean that they're actively hospitalized. That means that they've required hospitalization at some point during their illness. So four out of our 11 cases have required um, hospitalization at some point during their illness. None have fully recovered. So the, the important thing to know about that is um, the CDC has requirements that are, are required to be considered recovered. You have to be seven days out from symptom onset and uh, 72 hours from, um, you have to have 72 hours of being what is pretty much fully recovered. So that means no fever, um, you know, very minimal to no cough, um, that sort of thing. And you, you have to be fever free for 72 hours without the use of fever reducing medication, such as um, Tylenol, Motrin, that type of thing. So you have to meet both of those to be considered recovered. So right now we don't have anybody that's falling into that category and we're following up with these folks every day. So I wanted to break down um, that data a little bit. I've also got some questions and I'll try to get some of the questions that are coming in through Facebook Live, but um, people are submitting questions uh, via the website, which is what we asked for. Um, and so I wanna try to answer some of these and these may help some of the things that are coming through. So we're getting lots of questions about docu documentation related to travel. You do not need a special document to um, travel within the county. Um, and my understanding is that is the same in other counties, but you would have to check if you're traveling in another jurisdiction, but we are not requiring special documentation for people to travel within the county. Um, it would be very difficult for people to have um, documentation to go to the grocery store, that type of thing. Um, so that's important to know. Now, some businesses have decided that they want to give their employees um, documentation for that sort of thing, and that's up to them. They can certainly do that, but the county is not requiring special documentation to be able to travel within the county. I wanted to clarify a little bit um, social distancing. Um, so the goal of social distancing is that everyone stay six foot apart from another person or um, you know family members to another uh, family so I'm talking household members that type of thing if you're in Walmart with your child you know you, you and your child don't need to walk six foot apart but you need to stay six foot away from other people um, but when we talk about close contacts of a confirmed case which are the people that we're, we're concerned with when we're looking into and doing these um, investigations, close contacts is defined as someone being six foot or less from a confirmed case for now at least 10 minutes. So if you remember, they were saying 15 to 30, they've now downgraded that to 10 minutes. So that's that's really what is considered to be a close contact. So it you you need to stay six foot away from other people, if at all possible. Um, that doesn't mean that you, you know, if you're just in somebody's, uh, you know, close space for 30 seconds that that's okay we really need to maintain social distancing um, and we're, we're doing that inside our office and workplace and, and we encourage people to do that as much as they can um, wherever they are um, so I just wanted to clarify that a little bit uh, how many tests have been performed um, that people report uh, pending tests to us. Now, a lot of our providers are doing that. That way we have a good list and we know, um, you know who's pending that type of thing, but it is not required by law for them to do that. It is required by law that they um, report positives only. Um, isn't it true that the number of cases is probably much higher since asymptomatic people are being denied a test if a family member has tested positive? Um, I think what, what is true is that, um, you know, we know that there are three cases that we don't have a source for. So the likelihood is, is again, that there are, uh, cases out there and 80% of, um, people with COVID-19 have really mild symptoms. Um, but again, that's why we all need to be diligent in watching for those, um, those signs and symptoms. Now, um, people who are asymptomatic will not, uh, qualify for a test typically unless you know, the provider just decides to do that, but it's not recommended. The CDC does not recommend uh, testing people who are asymptomatic. Um, and, and even if a family member has tested positive. So what happens with families is this. So if, um, for example, if I tested positive um, in my family for COVID-19, all of my household members and my close contacts, so if I'd been in close contact with somebody here at work, um, and again, you know, I talked about that earlier in the video a few minutes ago, those people would all be quarantined and asked to stay home for 14 days and, and monitor their symptoms. 
Am I still able to care for an elderly uh, family member during the stay at home order? Yes. Um, we are strongly encouraging elderly people to stay home. Um, the care of those people, uh, you know, needs to be um, really a, a, a strong need. And we know that there's, there's lots of strong needs with caring for elderly folks. Um, so yes, you can still care for your children. You can still care for the elderly. Um, it really is, uh, you know, the, the intent of the order is that the maximum amount of people stay home as much as feasible. And we know um, as, as defined in the order, um, there are going to be exceptions uh, to that, exemptions to that, and we, we do have to continue caring for our family members. Um, and, and this kind of answers this question too, but if a family member or friend watches my child while I'm at work, are they still able to do that? Yes, child care is an essential service, and if you are working for a business that is essential or that serves an essential business that needs to remain open, um, you are absolutely able to do that. Again, what we're encouraging everybody to do is to not go to work if you don't if you don't feel well, if you're sick, if your child is sick, they should not attend. Uh, they should not attend child care. So those are the things that um, again are are important to remember in this. Let me um, back up a little bit and answer some questions, and then before I get off here, I've got some got some other things for you guys. Um, just trying to scroll through here and and answer some questions. And and just so you know too, the questions that we're not able to get to on the live, I'm I'm answering on our um, website. So it's under frequently asked questions um, on our website, COVID-19 updates is the tab. Um, so you can look through those and, and they're, they're divided out by category for what the question is. Are you going to do zip codes like um, Jefferson County? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how Jefferson County is doing what by zip codes, but um, if you're referring to the order, it's a countywide order. Um, oh, for if you're asking where I have somebody else in here from the corner, uh, she's over here in the corner, uh, helping me with, with some, uh, comments. And if you're asking about the zip codes of cases, we are not revealing where cases are located. Um, Really, we do an epidemiologic investigation. This is gonna answer some of these other questions I see coming through. We do an epidemiologic investigation on every single case that we get to identify those close contacts. So if there's close contacts, we are contacting them directly. Um, and again, we have 11 cases now. They're spread out throughout the county. Um, you know, it, it really is a, a, a moot point at this point uh, where these people are from, but we are reaching out to the people who are close con to that, contacts to these people to let them know. Um, is COVID-19 like the flu? Uh, if you, if you get it, do you have temporary immunity or can you still carry it? So, oh, oops, I'm so sorry. I'm hitting a button. Um, so there's some information on, um, CDC about that. There's, uh, there's still studying COVID-19. It's a brand new illness, a uh, brand new disease. Um, and so they're still studying that. They're not sure how long immunity lasts after, um, you get it. And so they really haven't come up with a definitive answer on that. Um, is COVID-19 with the flu, is, is it like the flu? That was kind of the first half of that question. Um, I mean, the symptoms are, are similar to the flu. However, um, what I would say is that, you know, there's been a lot of debate about, you know, numbers of the flu and how many people die from the flu and that sort of thing. Um, what I would say is this, you know, when, when we first started seeing these cases in the United States, you know, on, on the West Coast, you know, over in, in, in Washington State, um, there was a large um, population inside a, a nursing home. Um, multiple uh, elderly people died in that nursing home. If that was the flu, um, and I've talked about this before, but if that was the flu, that would make national news. Um, that is abnormal. Um, and so that's important to know that, you know, we have flu go through nursing homes all the time. You don't see it kill um, the number of people. I'm sorry, my phone it just rings. Um, we don't see it kill that many people in the wing in a wing of a nursing home. Um, you know, we've had over 1,300 cases of flu in the county this year so far, um, and you know we have had one death of flu. And so it's it's similar symptoms to the flu, but it's it's not exactly like the flu. And and that's important to know that this is different. And when we compare case counts um, to the flu, it, it's really not the same. It's like comparing your W2 to one check stub. Okay. So it's important to know that you're looking at, uh, you're not looking at apples to apples here. 
Um, it, how safe is it to go to the grocery store to go shopping? Um, you know, you have to do what is essential and you have to get groceries. What I would encourage people to do if you can is to, um, you know, utilize pickup, um, utilize delivery if you can. I know not everybody can do that, but that's what I would encourage is to really try to stay out of the grocery store as much as you can. Um, you know, try to get what you need in one trip. Um, you know, to last you a little bit so you're not having to go every day. And, I, and again, I realize that that's not always possible for everybody, but um, the more people that do that, the better. Um, that's less people that are in the store shopping. And, you know, when you're in the store shopping, take care to decrease um, uh, the interaction with other people. So, you know, try to try to steer clear of, of other people and stay, utilize that six foot, um, distance uh when you're out in the store but certainly curbside um pickup delivery options are our best um for groceries right now um how long does it usually take for an individual to recover from COVID-19 once they notice symptoms that in at least with the cases that we have that is varying um we I think we do have somebody who's quite close to being fully recovered as I defined earlier in the video. Um, but to be considered recovered from this illness, again, you have to be seven days out from symptom onset. So when you first started getting sick and free from symptoms for 72 hours. So it's, it's really been varying um, person to person. Now, the incubation period is 14 days. And what incubation period means is that's the time from exposure to the time that you um, can develop symptoms. So the 14 days is the longest period they've seen. The normal time is usually two to five days after being exposed is when people show symptoms, but they, they can, it can be up to 14 days after exposure um, when they show symptoms. I'm gonna do one more question and then I'll hit on just a couple other things. And then again, we'll, we'll continue to um, update these questions and, and get some of these answers up tomorrow on our website that we're not able to get to today. Oh, is there a certain percentage of patients that have little to no symptoms? Um, and if so, how do we know if there's a lesser, if they have a lesser chance of disease transmission? Um, so about 80% of cases of COVID-19 are very mild. Um, and that's really what makes it tough because maybe they've got, you know, a little bit of a fever. Maybe they really don't get sick enough that they even feel like going to the doctor. Um, and so, you know, how do we know if those people are, are really COVID positive or not? Um, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, and I think we're going to see changes over the next few weeks, um, in the way that we do investigations and in the way that they decide to test. Um, but what I would say right now is again, being diligent in every one of us, um, being very in tune to how we're feeling, you know, if we're feeling sick, if we're having a cough, um, if, you know, you're having a fever, you need to stay home. Um, call your healthcare provider, see if they want to test or see if they think um, that you have COVID-19. And certainly if you um, are feeling, you know, short of breath, that type of thing, um, that really is a concerning symptom. Shortness of breath is is concerning and, and does need to be addressed. Um, and you want to call your local hospital before visiting your local hospital, okay? Um, I'm going to answer one more. Uh, I know I said one more before, but I'm, I'm going to answer one more. What are you all doing to help the funeral home? So there's lots of funeral home guidance out there. We have funeral home guidance on our website. Um, and we would encourage, um, you know, funeral homes to take a look at that and then certainly reach out to us if they have any questions um, beyond that guidance that we can, we can help them with. Um, so I wanted to just kind of mention a couple of things um, before I hop off here and, and um, I only have just a couple minutes left here. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is, you know, I know that this is a very anxiety, um, anxious time. And um, I think this entire situation is creating a lot of anxiety in, in, in you know, our residents and, um, you know, people throughout the state. And um, I think it's important to know that sometimes you need to take a break. And, you know, maybe that's a break from social media, a break from the news. Um, you should stay informed. You need to stay informed about what's happening. But it's okay to step away and take a breather and try to do as much normal life as you can. Um, I've got a couple tips here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these up on our website too. Um, and, and these came to me from one of our staff members who's a social worker. 
and um, you know she encourages encourages you to keep a routine. Um, you know, wake up, go to bed as you normally do. Um, you know, this gives us a sense of safety, comfort, routine. Um, get get sunlight if you can. If you can go outside and and spend some time on your porch or um, you know away from people, but you know if you can get sunlight, um, you know that go for a walk, do some yard work. Um, that really will um, boost your mood. Um, calling friends. Um, you know, this is a this is a very unfortunate time, and we're living in an unprecedented um, time. But you know, we also have a lot of be it at home, you know, maybe you clean closets out that you never have. Um, something to take a break and and live and live normal life for a minute. But again, staying informed, um, you know, this this helps us to reduce anxiety in in these times. Um, I wanted to say another uh, thing that to ask ask you to to help me out a little bit. So. There's been information about the stay at home order out on our website, out on in local media, in, in print media, and radio media, that type of thing. But if you have elderly members of your family, I would ask that you also try to reach out to them and make sure they're staying informed because I know it can be uh, tough if they're kind of separated from, you know, some of the, the news sources, that thing, even, even if we have had it on the radio and in the paper, but if you can help us in helping them stay informed and helping them stay in their homes, um, you know, people who are elderly and at most risk, um, people who have, um, immunocompromised systems, um, you know, that really will help us. Um, and we really appreciate that if you can help keep them up to date. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is, um, un unfortunately, uh, we lost a, a community servant um, yesterday, Dan Duncan. And Dan has been working with the health department uh, over the last several weeks, and um, he's the county emergency manager. And I, I just want to say that, um, you know, he really has been a public servant. I feel like he has been a, a direct extension of the health department and um, just really a, a huge resource for us. And um, I just want to say, you know, my condolences to to him and his family and all his, his coworkers. And, you know, I, I say that to say this. Thank you to the first responders and, um, you know, our, our EMS workers, policemen, fire, um, the healthcare providers, all of the people out there um, who are working on this issue and, and you, the public, for, um, you know, reaching out, trying to stay informed and, and doing the things that have been asked of you, even though um, it's, it's very out of the norm. Um, you know, I, I would just say thank you. It makes a difference. You may not ever know that it made a difference, but it is making a difference. Um, and we appreciate your help in that. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who has been on here and has reached out. Um, we'll continue to do these Facebook Lives um, twice a week at 2 p.m. So I'll see you next Tuesday at 2 p.m. But I'm also updating media on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays at 2 p.m. So you might be hearing some things come out through media. And then we'll update our case counts every day at around 4 p.m. Um, and again, a thank you. Thank you to everyone out there who's who's working on the front lines um, to fight this. We appreciate you. Um, you can reach out to us um, directly via phone, 573-431-1947, or via our website um, on the Contact Us tab. You can reach out via Facebook too. It's just we don't have somebody who stays on social media. We don't have a social media person. So you're likely to get a quicker response if you if you call us directly or send something through the website because that comes through via email. So we'll go through these questions, answer them, and get those on our website tomorrow. We appreciate you all, um, and I will see you on Tuesday. Thank you.